Hi everyone, welcome back to Falcon's House. I was recently featured on a Thunder podcast called Mr. Pressy's Neighborhood, and I got permission to repost the audio here. Welcome to Mr. Presti's Neighborhood, an Oklahoma City Thunder podcast inspired by the Daily Thunder community that is for Thunder fans, ran by Thunder fans. I'm your host, Brandon Rabar, and this week's episode is entitled, We're Going Streaking! Do you get it, Rachel? I get it, Brandon. Thank you. Old school joke. Thank you. (laughs) Yes, it is. Our special guest this week is Daily Thunder's own Matt Craig. He is a, a special writer. <laughs> I'm sure that is not your official title. I just called you a special writer. Special writer. Wow. My mom <laughs> thinks I'm special. <laughs> well, she's probably going to be listening to this show. So that's why, you know, I gave you the proper <laughs> title. And as always, we feature not only a reporter, a journalist, a special writer, but we also feature an Oklahoma City Thunder fan on the show as well. And this week, that honor goes out to Josh Craig, a very special guy <laughs> uh, let's uh let's introduce you guys real quick josh you're an old pro here on uh, mr Presty's neighborhood how many times have you been on the show now this is my third time. third time yeah. do you remember who else you were with before like were you on with any like writers or i was on with anthony slater before he went oh to- that puts a little bit of pressure on matt to live up to anthony slater well, I'm not sure Anthony Slater is a special writer, um, <laughs> and as we've already established, I am. So that's true. The pressure true. is all on him, and we've also established that Anthony is a traitor as well. So, <laughs> and he's also, I guess, kind of my colleague uh, since he works for the Athletic in San Francisco, and I work for the Athletic on the, on the college basketball side. So. I don't know. I don't, I'm conflicted. I guess I'm conflicted. That's funny. And we had Darnell on who works for the athletic, you know, maybe we should just make this the, uh, athletic sponsored show and not daily thunder. (laughs) There you go. My first allegiances are to the thunder. So, uh, both those guys are traitors in my book. (laughs) Good man. (laughs) Um, okay. So Josh has been on here a few times now, Matt, I know that you've been on down to dunk several times with Andrew Schlett, who was also a a guest here on the show a few weeks ago, but tell our listeners in case they don't know, I know you write for daily thunder. Your mom knows that as well, but tell everyone (laughs) else who doesn't know about Matt Craig. Tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of maybe how you got into the thunder, how you got into writing, how long you've been with daily thunder, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So growing up in Oklahoma, I still remember going to one of the games when the Hornets were in town. And I mean, the Oklahoma City ties run deep. And so when the Thunder came, you know, that was obviously a huge deal. And I was, you know, a number one fan. And then when I went to college, I thought sports media was something I was going to want to do for a career. And I literally just sent out an email to Weston Shepard, who is now running Daily Thunder. But at the time, Up the Thunder and Daily Thunder were two separate sites, and they only had two people working at the time. They were looking to expand with some more written content. So I guess I I just got kind of lucky catching them at the right time, and and they were interested in what I had to do with what I had to write and the things I sent in. And so I've been working last season and this season for Up the Thunder and now with the Daily Thunder and last year during the playoff run, I was writing a every morning. It was kind of a daunting test, but every morning I wrote an opinion column called a uh, wake up call during the playoffs last year and got some really nice feedback from some people. And so we are continuing that into this year, every Saturday morning, once a week doing an opinion column on the site. So, uh, and I'm sure the people that are listening, I've been roasted in the comments section of my daily thunder articles plenty of times. What for? Uh, Oh, I mean, anything, anything that seems to come up. So I'm sure people are, are aware of me from trashing my articles. So <laughs> well, nobody's going to trash you on this show. OK, yeah, well, that makes me feel good. Actually, I can't promise that Josh may just tear into you. <laughs> he may not like so your opinions. Josh is kind of a jerk. So just <laughs> I was intimidated until I heard me and him have the same last name. And now, I mean, he can't insult me. We're like blood brothers. <laughs> yes, you probably have like the same aunt or something like that. Okay, so let's jump into this show. I'm really curious to see what you guys think 
about the state of the Thunder right now because fans are kind of all over the place. The Thunder are on a two-game winning streak, but this precedes the last six games in which they lost five of six. And then this last win against the Spurs. My first question actually is this. Let me get to it. Is there such thing as a moral loss or is a win a win? Because if you kind of take the pulse of Thunder fans right now, after that, you know, you would think that beating the Spurs, everybody would be feeling good. Finally got a couple wins in a row against the Timberwolves and Spurs. Two of the teams that, you know, really the Thunder are, are competing for that three seed with. Ultimately, I think that's where they want to get to because they don't want to play the Warriors in the second round. So back-to-back wins, but that Spurs win, obviously, no Kawhi, no LaMarcus Aldridge, no Rudy Gay, and then the second half, no Pal Gasol, no Patty Mills, Kyle Anderson leaves early, and then they struggle to win. So is there such a thing as a moral loss or is a win a win? What do you think, Josh? I think that right now I'll take a win as a win. I think there are situations where moral losses could happen, but I think right now we're close enough to everybody else that – as long as we're winning and we're slowly making ground on everybody else, if we do figure this all out, we'll be fine. Right. You know, the good thing is, as much as the Thunder have struggled this season and, you know, the blown leads and the double digit leads that they blew and all that, they're still not all that far out of the three, four, five seed. Other teams have been struggling as well. Some of that due to injuries, new players, or just underperforming. So it's not just the Thunder pretty much hitting everybody except for the Rockets, it seems right now in the Western Conference. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I mean, as you said, they're only three games out of the four seed at the moment, which is the Nuggets and the Timberwolves both tied for that. And so all hope is not lost. (laughs) But I agree that when you're (laughs) eight and 11, eight and 12 at one point, any win is a good win. But I, I would say it's summarized. The feeling is summarized in the text messages I get from my brother, who's a huge Thunder fan, but doesn't watch all the games. And he's been texting me after these losses going, we lost to the Mavericks. And (laughs) he did the same thing today with, wait, we beat the Spurs. And then I sent back, well, they were without Kawhi and Lamarck Soldiers and Tony Parker and Rudy Gay. And, and then all I get back is, Oh, that was the only text message I get back. So I'm not sure Thunder fans are fully, I don't know, back on board. I think we want to think that this is the time we're going to go on a streak and not to pat myself on the back, but at the beginning of the season, I said early December, we have a really soft schedule. And I think that's the time where we can maybe go on a run. And and I still believe that with Brooklyn Nets, Memphis Grizzlies, uh, Hornets, Pacers, Sixers, Knicks, like this run of games coming up is pretty weak. So this is the time to do it. But based on what I've seen, the problems have not all been solved. Let's just put it that way. Right. It's funny, too, because you say that about the soft December and they have probably on paper the two toughest games out of the way and they're both wins. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the, the first not full strength. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're right. The Rockets on Christmas. OK, well, the second and third toughest teams probably <laughs> for the month are out of the way and they're both W's. But, you know, obviously the Spurs game definitely comes with an asterisk. But some of those games are a little bit tougher now than they looked before. The 76ers, obviously, that young talent, any given night, they can beat any team. We play the Jazz a couple times, and all of a sudden they have Rudy Gobert back. The Hornets have been tougher than thought. Pacers, of course, that's going to be Paul George's Mm -hmm. return home. So, I mean, there's going to be some extra motivation and emotion on both sides. At the Knicks, all of a sudden isn't a gimme anymore like, you know, everybody thought before. So, I agree with you that that on paper, there's a lot of soft games, but I don't know. Uh, especially <laughs> towards the end of the month, you know, you got the Rockets, Raptors and Bucks all in a row. I do think, though, that and we'll get to this a little bit later, but I do think that the uh, Thunder do have a streak in them. And if it's going to come, it should come this month, right? The thing, Yeah, the thing I'd say just really quickly is like we're at the point now where I'm not sure we can look at any opponents and say that it, that it's a gimme game or an easy game. You know, we're 10 and 12 at the moment. And those teams that you mentioned all probably some of those teams have better records than us. So I don't think we can really look at yeah. anybody, you know, and say that these are games we should win because if that team plays like they did against the Warriors, then they should beat anybody. So that shows that they can't can't beat anybody. So I I agree that there's no such thing as, you know, wins that are scheduled in like you may expect from past Thunder teams. 
Right, exactly. And, you know, they play like they do against the Warriors. They can be anybody, but they play like they do against the Kings or Mavs yeah. Oh, yeah. or Magic. They can lose to anybody on any given night. Now, piggybacking the Spurs question, after the Spurs game, Billy Donovan mentioned that he liked the way the team played. And he meant, you know, they were moving the ball. They were sharing the ball. They were taking better shots. And if you look at it, they pretty much eliminated the mid-range game. Most of the shots came at the rim, and they took a lot of corner threes against the Spurs. Now, shots didn't fall. That was a huge problem. Paul George was 2 of 17. A lot of issues at the free throw line. Um, but there are a lot of good shots. But then a lot of fans are like, are you kidding me? Did you see them just barely beat that G League team? So what do you guys think? Do you guys think that was just coach speak? Or do you think there's something to it? Did you see a little improvement there, even if it didn't reflect on the scoreboard? What do you think, Josh? I mean, there was improvement for sure, but I think more of the improvement was the game before that. That's where we saw tons of ball movement. Everything seemed to be clicking, except for like maybe in the second quarter and the beginning of the third quarter. But against the Spurs, like the offense disappeared, but it is the Spurs and Greg Popovich is still probably the best coach right now. You know, it's so funny with the Spurs. You know, when they rested all the guys, especially in the second half, and of course, everybody here knows Joffrey Laverne and, you know, guys like Kyle Anderson and Murray and all that. But then I saw these guys I'd never heard of. Who was that big, huge white dude that was hitting shots from half court? He could not miss. It's just amazing to me. You know, the guys at the Spurs will just pull out of nowhere. This is probably like their version of Kyle Singler, except in this like bizarro world of Kyle Singler, he's hitting half court shots at the end of the uh, shot clock. Who was that guy? I can't remember. Davis Bertans, the other Latvian. <laughs> yes, that's right. The that's right. It was just, I mean, it's just amazing to me. I mean, and obviously, you know, should the Thunder have ran away with the game in the second half? Yeah, probably if you look at the talent level. But like Josh said, this is pop. There is a system. I mean, I'm not going to call Kawhi Leonard a system player like Katie did a few years ago, but there is a definite system in that I think that with the Spurs more so than any other team, they can kind of plug and play. And with that, you're going to get a competitive game no matter what. I mean, look, the Thunder outscored probably their second string by 11 in the first half, and then they pretty much played the third string in the second half, and that's where they struggled. It's just amazing to me what Pop can pull. I mean, and look at their record this year. They haven't had Kawhi all year. I mean, and a lot of those guys have been in and out, and they still have a really good record. What do you think, Matt? Going back to the, I just wanted to pick yeah. back what Josh was saying. But do you see improvement in this team from this last couple games? Yeah, I mean, based on what you just said, I, I mean, I had a chance to go to Orlando and cover the Thunder team, and the guy I was most impressed with there is Brandon Paul, who the Spurs picked up undrafted, and, and he ended up starting against the Thunder uh, the other night. And then Derek White, he's the guy that I wanted the Thunder to draft. Uh, and right. the, the Spurs ended up getting him. So they have talented players, and that is not a – that's why, to me, it's not a moral loss. I think any time you can beat the Spurs, then you walk away with your head high. But is there improvement in stretches? The, the problem has always been just putting those stretches together. And the thing that has made me so confused when you're trying to explain, you know, either writing or on a podcast to people like what's wrong. Everyone wants to know what's wrong. You know, what can we fix? It's like we have really good players who are not playing like really good players. Yes. And that's just very, very difficult to diagnose because, you know, these are three guys that take a lot of mid-range jump shots, but they're also three guys that make a lot of mid-range jump shots, and they've been right. awesome at that for their whole careers, and they just haven't played well. And that right there is impossible to say, you know, any one thing that could fix it. It could be a million different things. So in stretches, they've looked great, and I do think the last two games that the, the sharing the ball has been better, less stopping the ball. Yes. And, you know, there's still the same amount of isolations, but someone has gotten to them and told them if you attack right away, then those isolations aren't quite as much of an eyesore and they don't stop the offense up. So I think the form has been better, but the results really haven't in stretches. So I don't I don't really know what you take from that. I mean, these three guys over an 82 game span, you just assume will eventually find their form, I guess. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that. And let's go down that rabbit hole a little bit because I, to me, that's the biggest thing. Everybody wants to know what's going on with the Thunder. They have all this talent. They have the the big three now, these three superstars, and they're sitting at a 10 and 12 record, kind of hit rock bottom with the 8 and 12 record. You see the flashes of potential, but then they lose all these big leads. And to me, what it comes down to, and I've told people this, 
I think it's exactly what you said. The three superstars haven't played like themselves. <laughs> they have not at all performed like the three superstars that they all. They're all shooting, I believe, career lows, or at least I'm pretty sure that Paul George and Carmelo are both shooting career lows. Uh, Russ is near it. And, and you look at the, it's not just, you know, from the field, from the free throw line, just across the board. I mean, they're just not shooting well. Some of that shot selection, sure. But a lot of it is just shots aren't falling. They'll attack the rim, whether they're getting fouled and it's not being called or whether they're just not finishing or, or whatever it is. You know, I think that we all thought that you put these three superstars on the team, then they're going to shoot better than they ever have before because there's more space. I mean, that makes sense, right? I mean, yep. we all thought that. I mean, who, uh, who doesn't? Yeah, the Thunder game, the second half, the big three shot, eight of 30 from the field combined in that game against the Spurs. And I, the thing that, you know, you we took for granted coming into the season was we said, oh, we have three of these guys. So on any given night, one of them will be hot. <laughs> that right, has right. not been the case. I mean, we thought we could no. out talent teams when we weren't playing well because one guy would go off. And that, we have, yes. the Thunder have not gotten that kind of boost all season. Right. Which is amazing. You're exactly right. And it just blows me away because Russ by himself pretty much last year carried and dragged this team to 47 wins. And, you know, he never could, you know, take a night off. He could never rely on another star to do it. And and here we are with three and you're right. It just hasn't been enough. And what's crazy is some of our most consistent players are guys that you wouldn't expect. We'll talk about them a little bit later, but Steven Adams has been unreal. Uh, Jeremy Grant, I think is definitely taken a little bit of a leap and he's much improved. Raymond Felton has been great off the bench, you know, so a lot of the areas in which the Thunder didn't have help last year, they have helped this year as far as bench, role players, Steven Adams stepping up and those kind of things. But now for some reason, our superstars aren't playing as well as they can. And honestly, whereas on one side of that, it makes me feel lousy. The other side kind of encourages me because I'm like, well, that just can't continue, right? I mean, these are three of the best players in the world. It's, they can't just continue playing this badly. Things are going to click at some point. I mean, they couldn't have all just forgotten how to play basketball. So I think that things will change. And especially if these habits change and sharing the ball and all that, that'll help as well. So, but I'm glad that you said that now is a streak coming. That's two wins in a row. Is a streak coming or does it end this week? What do you guys think? I think it's going to go all the way until the Houston game. Oh, wow. Oh, really? That'll be 12. Now let me put a little backstory here. Josh isn't usually, I'm usually the sunshine pumper of the daily thunder comment section. And Josh is always kind of the realist. So if you say that, that makes me feel really good. Now tell me a little bit more. I mean, the schedule, like we should be able to beat a lot of these teams. The hardest games are at home. So like, and the two games been really- jazz are both home games for us. And we're a lot better at home. We yes. only have two road wins, but we have almost all of our other wins, obviously are at home. So we should no, be you're okay. exactly right. And, and that's something that hasn't been talked about either. This team's road struggles versus their success at home. Great record at home. I think only three losses at home all year. And, and each of those, I think, kind of came down to final possession type game. So, wow. Okay, so 12 in a row. So that would put the Thunder at what, like 18 and 12 going into the Rockets game? Yeah. I like the way you think, Josh. <laughs> I hope you're right. What about you, Matt? What do you uh, think? I am not so optimistic. I mean... There are three instances during that span of three games and four nights, and that third game is on the road. I guess the first one is three games and five nights. They play Memphis on the ninth, and that's the third game and five nights on the road. They play the Knicks, third game and four nights on the road on the 16th, and then they play the Jazz, third game and four nights on the road. Those are just tough, tough games. You know, when you're on the second part of a back-to-back, you know, the third game and four nights, that sort of thing, and you're on a road, um, those are really, really tough games. And I don't know. I mean, I think to this point, the Thunder will have need will need to have shown consistency that they have not shown to this point. I would take like, give me three wins in four games a couple times. You know, I'm fine with no 12 game winning streak. That would be great. But give me a couple instances where they win a pocket of games and then, they'll, you know, lose and, and win a couple more. That would be enough for me because... As we already said, they're really not that far out of contention, but they need to start showing a little bit more consistency. So I don't know. I, I'm not, I guess I'm not quite as optimistic as you guys. As you were talking, I just got a notification. I think it bears sharing. 
uh, from ESPN. Katie and DeMarcus Cousins have to be held back by teammates during altercation. Both get ejected. That's Katie's second ejection, what, in the past, like, two or three ga- three games? That's insane. Who is this dude? He's so ejection. insecure. Man, it is nuts. Uh, something is going on with that dude mentally. Like, he just needs to relax in how good he is. But for some reason... He has this chip on his shoulder that I don't understand. Also, in that same game, Steph Curry apparently rolled his ankle extremely badly and had to be helped to the locker room. So, Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, via Anthony Slater, three ejections in his last 18 games after only two ejections in the first 810 games of his career. Wow. Uh, I'm wow. confused. Is KD nice? Is KD not nice? Uh, it's yeah. hard to keep track. Yeah, for real. I think we can officially say Katie is not nice. I mean, it, it's, it's such a strange, strange... He warned us with all those commercials. He did. He tried to tell us. We weren't listening. How naive we were. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought five years ago you see a Katie DeMarcus Cousins fight and you're rooting for DeMarcus Cousins? <laughs> 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 okay, so let's get on to the uh, next talking point here. Everyone assumed that maybe the Thunder's two best bench players this year would be Alex Sabrinas and Patrick Patterson. I know I did. I thought that those two guys, Patterson, you know, at first was going to be the starting power forward and everybody was happy with that. And, you know, as good as Alex Sabrinas looked last year, shooting over 38 percent from three on high volume as a rookie, I think everybody expected a leap there. Strangely, those two might be the two that have struggled the most. And, you know, that's kind of key in some of the Thunder's issues as well. We need these guys to step up. Will either of them step up, both of them, or neither? What's going to happen? Will these guys turn things around? What do you think, Josh? I think they both should turn things around. They both missed a lot of time in the summer. Right. And so there's, and we started the season two weeks earlier than normal. So they're probably just a little bit out of shape still, and they should slowly come back on. They've been better the last few games. They have it's, it's, been playing a lot more power forward instead of backup center. So, which, which is much, much better. That's just not his game. I mean, he's just a stretch four is what he is, and he really shouldn't be playing backup center. I'm not sure that Jeremy Grant is either. I like him as a small ball center. I think that that's one of our issues. Actually, I think that we either need to play Dakari some with that bench, depending on you know the opposition, or we need to go out and. You know, whether it's a buyout candidate like a Tyson Chandler or something like that, or make a move for a guy who can kind of shore up rebounds and defense on that uh, second unit. But I think we need a little bit of size. But yeah, I don't like Patterson as a five. I like him as a four. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I, I think the superstar struggles have put a lot of stress on Billy Donovan because, and he's notoriously, he's a tinkerer. So he changes his lineups a lot. He did that even when he was coaching at Florida. But if the superstars were playing better, like the way that you would expect, I think there would be more consistency with the lineups. But because they have struggled, it's forced Billy Donovan to try out different lineups every night. Like there was uh, the game three games ago when, you know, the Thunder were still the worst team in the NBA when we thought that. Alex Sabrinas and Josh Eustis were did not play coach's decision. They just didn't play. And then the next game they come back and they play 20 minutes. So it's been kind of inconsistent. The way I, I come down on it is on Patterson. He has been really, really bad and he was really good last year. And I remember telling people how good he would be as a fit with the thunder. And then we got him on that great deal. And all of NBA Twitter was like, we made the best deal in the world. And I guess other yes. NBA teams knew something that we didn't, or, you know, got some medical information that we didn't because he just hasn't looked like himself And I don't know, I guess I would hope that he would return to form this season, but it could be something with a, with an older player coming off an injury where he's just never the type of player that he was last season. And then with Abrinas, I really feel like he just needs to get more minutes. He's a shooter that plays inconsistent minutes. It's really hard to find your rhythm. Uh, and, And the difference is when he's on the floor, so he hasn't been making his threes, right? So some people could say, well, then he's just like a Brinus, but he can't defend like him. But the difference is when he's on the floor, he's still treated as a shooter. So yes. defenders still have to respect him and close out. And that allows for the offensive spacing that the Thunder don't have when uh, Andre Robertson's on the floor. So even if he's not making shots, I think he needs to get more minutes, play more with these guys because he's a good piece for spacing the floor 
for the other stars. I 100% agree with that. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a big Alex Sabrina's fan. He's kind of my NBA spirit animal. Uh, <laughs> he is. He's a skinny white dude that shoots threes. And I completely agree with you. Spacing is huge for this team, especially to allow guys like Russ and Paul George and Melo to operate. And the numbers bear it out as far as, you know, plus minus and, and net rating and all those things. When you look at pairings of the different teammates and things like that in different lineups, I mean, when Abrinas is in there, like you said, even if he's not hitting his threes, he's still helping the team because you have to guard him. It makes a big, big difference and it spaces the floor. And I like what you said. You ask any shooter, it is really hard to go in Maybe you don't play one night, then the next night you do play, but it's for three minutes in the first Mm -hmm. half and then four and a half minutes in the second half. And you might get two shots and maybe you miss both of those shots. And then it looks like, oh, Alex can't shoot anymore. I mean, come on. The dude is a a natural born shooter. He can shoot lights out. That's not a problem. It's just really hard, you know, when you're getting random minutes, random shots. And then, you know, you kind of force some shots, too. I don't know that Alex is really guilty of this too much. He's shot some shots that maybe he wouldn't shoot before, but you kind of feel like I got to get some shots up. I'm here to shoot and I've only touched the ball twice in the past two games. I'm going to get a shot up now. So I think that all has a part to do with it. And I love what you said about Patterson. I was so excited about Patterson (laughs) and I do think that he can still be really helpful for this team. But for whatever reason, I mean, he does not look like he did in Toronto. I mean, you look at him and uh, the stat that I loved was when guarding an opponent, their field goal percentage goes down the most when guarded by Patrick Patterson, as opposed to their average more than any other player in the NBA. I mean, I was like, Whoa, I mean, this guy, and he was diverse and and he could shoot like 37% from three. I'm like, this is exactly what we need as a stretch four. And he hasn't done any of that here. He hasn't been shooting nearly as well. And his defense hasn't been as as stellar as it was before. Do you think that'll turn around? Do you think it is a, a knee thing or an age thing? Or or like Josh said, do you think it's a conditioning thing? I mean, I'm a little more skeptical than most because he has just not looked like himself at all. And I don't, I, you know, I'm obviously I'm not a doctor and, and I don't know the medical stuff, but. But you are a special rider. Right. And that definitely gives me plenty of credibility on the topic of Patrick Patterson's knee. Um, (laughs) But I'm a little skeptical, honestly, that he'll ever have, I don't know, just the bounce in his step that, that he seemed to have last year in Toronto. He was just all over the floor and he was making the smart play. We're, We're about to watch the Warriors game and I'm sitting with my family who all like the thunder, but don't follow these things. And I'm having to explain to them like, no, I promise this guy was really good last year. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and this is just not representative of that at all. I don't know. I mean, I, I how old is he? I, I probably need to look that up. I just don't know. I think he's 29. So yeah. it's, he's not too old. He's not too old. And, and again, it's case by case when it comes to knee surgeries like that. But I don't know that he'll ever be what he was. You know, I hope so. I hope so, too. Like you said, we got him on a killer deal. Just an absolute yeah. killer of a deal. Moving on from those two guys, I hope they do turn around. But let's talk about who has been the Thunder's best player this year and who is the Thunder's best player right now. I mean, obviously, you know, if you look at any sort of, you know, anything, the the obvious answer is Russ. Russ is the best player that the Thunder have. He's MVP. He's a top five player in the world. We all know that. But based on this season so far, who has been the Thunder's best player? Is it Russell Westbrook? Is it Paul George? Or is it, wait for it, Rachel? Is it Steven Adams? Has Steven Adams been the Thunder's best player so far this year? Yes. (laughs) Matt, in case you don't know, Rachel is a huge Steven Adams fan girl. As am I. (laughs) (laughs) She usually just jumps on if if we talk about Steven Adams the only time she'll jump on. The only time I even start listening to what you're saying. (laughs) What? Steven Adams? What? Yeah, she's the best. She's been playing doodle jump this whole time. (laughs) (laughs) Next question. He's the best. Uh, okay, so Josh, who has been the Thunder's best player this year? Russ, Paul George, or Steven Adams? I think it's Steven Adams. He's doing the most consistent, at least. Maybe yes. he doesn't have the best talent, but he makes a big impact on defense. And lately, he's been scoring really well. Mm-hmm. And he gets all the rebounds if Russ doesn't get them. If Russ doesn't get them. You know, it's crazy to have this conversation, right? But I think that he has been the Thunder's best player so far this year. I mean, that's nuts to say but he has been, the, of course, counterpoint to that. Hold on, counterpoint. The Thunder are 2-0 and 
when starting to Kari Johnson and Steven Adams doesn't play. So I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> Rachel's <laughs> flipping me off right now. <laughs> but pleasant surprise for sure. I think this is what we all knew that Steven was capable of and what we expected last year. But of course, one is hand being injured and then that paint being so packed by not having any shooters last year. You know, he's got much more room to operate now. What do you think, Matt? Who's the Thunder's best player this year? I mean, I think too often that performance is judged relative to expectations <laughs> and dude is this matt craig or is this vince lombardi i'm talking to well somebody needs to put that on like a, a special writer or something. um <laughs> but i i would i mean steven adams has been really good but it's relative to his expectation you know which was last year where he was battling lingering injuries and he just never got it together and there was questions over the offseason of we should trade him for marcus all or you know, right. the Marcus Cousins and uh, people were starting to be out on Steven Adams. And relative to that expectation, he has exceeded that definitely. Now, Russell Westbrook's expectation level was the MVP of the league who averaged a triple double and, you know, was top two in scoring or whatever. And, or he led the league in scoring, I think. And yeah, he did. With yeah. that kind of expectation level, he was never going to live up to that. Now, with yes. that being said, he has been bad, just flat out bad. <laughs> For yeah. a high usage yeah. player, he hasn't been bad relatively. He's been just bad. But I still think he has been the best player for the team because he is the engine, you know, that makes it go. And right. we saw when he is at his best, the Thunder are at their best. Now, we've seen games where Paul George has been awesome and the Thunder have been good. But that Warriors game when Russell Westbrook was playing like Russell Westbrook, and not thinking too much, which he seems like he's done about trying to defer or trying to make other guys fit in. And he hasn't been in that killer attack mode like we thought he always was because he's Russell Westbrook. He is still that guy for the Thunder. And relative to his expectations, he's been really bad. But to me, he's still the best player. Now, with that being said, the guy that I find myself trusting the most honestly right now is probably Paul George. Like, Every time he puts up a shot, I think it's going in. And, you know, yeah. there's no, no nothing to back that up. Just my watching a lot of games where it's like I, it feels great. When Russell Westbrook shoots a three, I don't assume he's making it for the most part. When <laughs> Carmelo shoots a three, I slap myself in the face. You know, I'm so like angry. I'm like screaming at the TV. But when Paul George sh shoots it, I feel like it's going in. And when Paul George is guarding somebody, I feel like he's going to steal the ball. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I feel good about Paul George. He's had some really, really bad nights. But if I had to say, if I had to pick one guy, it's still Russ. I would pretty much agree with with that assessment. Paul George, like you said, I think a lot of it is he doesn't really take bad shots. He may have cold shooting nights like he did against the Spurs last night where he was just god-awful, 2 of 17. I mean, that was the craziest thing. So many open corner threes, too, where he's just money from. I mean, he, he was just coming up short, going long. It was nuts. But for the most part, he takes good shots, clean looks. Carmelo takes so many freaking contested shots, and God love him, so does Russ. But Paul George really takes you know pr yeah. pretty clean looks. So I've, I probably feel best about Paul George's looks as well. That said, you're right. When Russ is Russ, that's when this Thunder team can be yeah. really, really special and when they're at their best. I'm, I'm really surprised nobody said uh, Raymond Felton. That dude is balled out this year. I mean, right. Wait, you were just complaining about people taking bad shots and then you complimented <laughs> Raymond Felton in the next sentence. I don't know. Something doesn't you know what's, compute there. What's weird though is he takes so many bad shots that go in. Like uh, when Katie was guarding him against the Warriors. Oh I mean, goodness. there was, he had no, he, he did like a Dion waiters fade away with Katie's like, you know, go, go gadget arms in his face. And he makes that shot. He makes so many shots he has no business of making, but I love him to death because he is not Samaj Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, oh, so goodness. last talking point here. We're a quarter into the season now. Give me your updated OKC record prediction. Josh. I think we win right around 50. Right around 50. Really? Okay, that's a realistic guess, I would say now. I went from like high 50s before the season to... Low 50s. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. Before the season, I said 60 wins. I think I went 61 Ooh. and and 21 before the season. I mean, but you got to hear me out. I mean, Russ carried this team to 47 wins last year by himself. I figured adding Paul George, a top 12-ish talent, and Carmelo, 
adding some pieces like Patterson and Felton, I really thought that they would win 60 games. I'm adjusting mine now to 52 wins. I'm going to say 52 and 30. What do you say, Matt? Well, in order for them to, you know, win 52 games, so 52 and 30 would be the total. They have to go 42 and 18, 42 and 18 the rest of the way. That's pretty, that's pretty special <laughs> if that's the case <laughs> in order to finish there. I don't know. I, I feel like they're going to turn it around at some point, but I'm, I'm topping out at 48 wins. The thing I will say is that I think the Western Conference playoff totals are going to come in much lower than projected. Yes. Um, for example, like if even at the top, even if Steph Curry has to miss time with this ankle injury, apparently, you know, there's video of him now. He's walking out of the arena on crutches. They're not going to win 67.5 or whatever their over under was. The Rockets, they might exceed their total, but I don't think the other Western Conference playoff teams will have that high of record. And I think 48 wins, maybe 49 wins might get you that four seed. Um, the Thunder don't obviously want the four seed, but the w- Rockets might be the number one seed which is something that was not anticipated for coming in. It was, we need to get to the three because we're trying to avoid the Warriors. Well, that might be the four seed now if the Rockets stay on this pace. So 49 wins in the four seed, it really doesn't sound too bad right now. I would still much, much prefer to play the Rockets in the second round than the Warriors. You know, assuming the Thunder can get out of the first round, much rather play no question. The, the Rockets. I mean, yes, if Curry has to miss some time, I could definitely see the Rockets getting that one seed. I mean, the Rockets look really good. Obviously, the Warriors have, to their standards, struggled thus far. But yeah, absolutely. Avoid the Warriors in the second round at all costs. If that means getting the four seed instead of the three seed, if the Rockets are going to get the one, I am all for that. And you're right. You know, you got teams like the Clippers and Grizzlies who've had some injuries. Uh, you know, probably not going to be in the playoffs this year. Their numbers going to be lower. But I think that when you look up and down the the West, you know, the East is stronger now. So they're picking up some losses where they wouldn't have before. And then you got some teams at the bottom of the West now who on any given night, you know, are knocking off some of the top teams, which you didn't really see in years prior. You know, yep. teams like the Mavs and the, and the Kings and even the Lakers uh, are knocking some of those top teams off. So I do think that you'll see. If the, if the Thunder can get to 49 wins, I mean, the teams that would have to get to 50 wins. So these teams would need to get to 50 wins. The Nuggets, the Timberwolves, or the Trailblazers, or the Jazz. I just, I'm, To me, I don't see any of those teams winning 50 games. So if the Thunder can get to 49, I think that might be the four seed. I think the Spurs yeah. will be above 50, and obviously the Rockets and the Warriors, but 49 in the four seed is what Thunder fans should probably be hoping for right now. Now that all the boring and thunder talk is out of the way, let's get to the stuff that everybody actually listens to MPN for in the first place. We are going to do the Mr. Presti's Neighborhood Hot Seat. This is rapid fire questions. Now, it can be anything from thunder to NBA to movies, music, sports, TV shows. It doesn't matter. But this week is a little something different because Christmas is on the way and because I am such a uh, Christmas nerd for Christmas movies and music and TV shows. You're a Christmas nerd? Is that a thing? I don't know. I just made it up. I just made it up. I'm Anything Christmas can nerd. be a subculture these days. Exactly. <laughs> Look on Reddit. I bet you there's like a subreddit for nerd Christmas Reddit. nerds. <laughs> we are going to do the Mr. Presley's Neighborhood Hot Seat Christmas edition. This is going to be all Christmas movies and TV specials. Are you boys ready? It is... Craig versus Craig, <laughs> Josh versus Matt, and uh, Rachel is going to keep score here. Are you ready for this? Let's do it. You boys ready? Let's do it. All right. The Mr. Pressy's Neighborhood Hot Seat. Question number one is going out to Josh. Rank these Christmas movies. Jingle All the Way, Surviving Christmas, Home Alone 2. And, of course, I should say this. Some of these are just opinions, and they don't seem like they have actual answers. <laughs> Believe me, they do. It's basically whatever my opinion is. Um, Home Alone 2, Jingle All the Way, Surviving Christmas. Oh, I'm sorry. That is actually incorrect. I would have accepted either Home Alone 2 or Surviving Christmas in the one or two spots, but Jingle All the Way is definitely number three. I am sorry, Josh. You're 
Absolutely incorrect. Now, Mr. Craig, I'm talking to you, Matt. All right. You're kind of nervous is, now. <laughs> hey, you should be. You should be. One of my favorite Christmas movies of all time is the hilarious romantic comedy Love Actually. Okay. Yes, I just admitted it. I like I'm it too. Afraid. I admit it as well. Good man. Good man. All right. Your question is this Tell me two names of actors or actresses in the movie Love Actually. Uh, Colin Firth and Kira Knightley. <clears throat> Next question. Dude, like <laughs> you definitely have to have your man card taken away, but I had mine taken away a long time ago, so I'm so happy to have, you know, you here with me. This is awesome. I mean, I, could, said I could keep going. I mean, <laughs> I know. You're, you're losing credibility with everyone <laughs> but me. You're gaining so much of my respect right now. Keep going. How no, many can you name? No, I, I'm going to know. I'm, I'm, I'm stopping there. I'm stopping there. <laughs> okay. Josh, name a Christmas song you wish you never had to hear again. And basically, if I like this song, you don't get a point. And if I don't like the song, you do get a point. Uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Re Reindeer. Oh, screw you, Josh. <laughs> How can anybody, what kind of soulless person doesn't like Rudolph? Are you kidding me? No, Josh does not get a point. <laughs> Man. All right, Ebenezer. What's your answer to that, Brandon? Uh, I would have accepted anything from the uh, Mariah Carey catalog. Oh, Besides, <laughs> hold on. Besides, all I okay. want for Christmas is you. Okay. Besides, all I want. You would for knock Christmas. out like Christmas shoes. <sighs> yeah, that one's really, really real sad. Bad. All I want yeah. for Christmas is you is my favorite Christmas song. I, I yeah. love it. I, I may or may not have had the full CD because of that one song, mm -hmm. and and I may have listened to it a lot, and I got really tired of it. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I like Love Actually too. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, best Christmas TV special of all time. Charlie Brown Christmas, Frosty, or How the Grinch Stole Christmas? Oh, man. This is your opinion, so I need to think. I need to put myself in your it's shoes. Just, yes. Oh, you seem like a How, I, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I, I do love How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I These are actually my three favorites. So this is really hard for me to tell you that you're wrong, but you oh. are. <laughs> I do love the Grinch, but my all-time favorite is actually, strangely, Frosty the Snowman. He's so lovable. I love the guy. Overrated. <laughs> oh, take away a point from Matt as well. <laughs> zero to zero. <laughs> That's an exciting game. Okay, Josh, back to you. Best Santa, Tim Allen and the Santa Claus, Edward Asner and Elf, or Edmund Gwynn and Miracle of 34th Street? I think it's 34th Street. Whoa, you're right. I did not expect Aww. you to pick him. I thought you'd be like one of these millennials who, who would choose either Elf or Santa Claus, which also I do love those as well. Matt, my question for you, Die Hard. Is it a Christmas movie? Yes or no? I Yes. I rewatched it uh, probably two weeks ago, and it might just be my favorite Christmas movie. It is Boom. a Christmas movie. Matt gets a point. That is absolutely correct. Give him a point. Josh, my question for you. Gremlins, is it a Christmas movie? Yes or no? No. <laughs> Wrong. It is absolutely a Christmas movie. He was not confident it, with that. He was, no. I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, I'm sorry, Josh. You're absolutely incorrect. I still feel bad for saying screw you earlier, but you really <laughs> hit a trigger point when you when you were hating on Rudolph. Uh, but no, you're you're incorrect. Gremlins. It's it's set at Christmas. He buys the Mogwai as a Christmas present. It opens up with snowfall and Christmas music. Gremlins is absolutely a Christmas movie. All right, last question of the hot seat goes to you, Matt. Billboard has Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas <sighs> at the top of the Christmas chart. You said it was your favorite Christmas <laughs> song of all time. Matt, for a point and for the win, please sing me a line or two of All I Want for Christmas is you. Oh. <clears throat> what more can I do? Baby, all I want for Christmas is you. <laughs> Give him the point. Uh, you pay, I, wow, I, that was almost that was almost fixed for me. That <laughs> that song, I will sing and dance to that song all day. 
You know what's crazy? I'm not lying. Uh, Rachel and I wrote these questions before the show. I had no idea that that was your favorite Christmas song. And neither uh, Rachel actually wrote that question. You can thank her for that. And I do not like Mariah Carey, but that song is a jam. Uh, that song's awesome. You can't argue with number one on the Christmas 100 of Billboard. No, you can't. No, you cannot. What was the final score there on the Mr. Presley's Neighborhood Hot Seat? Two to Matt and one to Josh. However, it would have been three to Matt had you not subtracted one of his points. <laughs> hey, what did he do that ticked me off? I don't remember. I don't remember. I <laughs> well, didn't deserve to have that point taken I, away I forgive then. and forget really easily unless you talk bad about Rudolph. I was going to say, you remember Josh's, but he didn't take yeah. his point away. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Matt. You are the Mr. Presti's Neighborhood Neighborhood for a Day. Would you like to give a speech? Maybe I know that your mom is listening. Not only are you a special writer, you are a special singer and a special winner as well. Anything you'd like to say to your mom? I do not think that Anthony Slater would have sung two lines from All I Want for Christmas is You on this podcast. <laughs> and I did. So, Mom, you should be proud. You did not birth a singer, but you birthed an excellent trivia player. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Congratulations. Goes out to Matt's mom. Well done, Matt's mom. <laughs> you got it going on. Uh, Josh, any shout outs you'd like to give as we close the show? No, I think I'm good. <laughs> Come on. You got to get, you gotta get at least, I'm gonna you force at least you. one. I'm not going to be rejected like that. No, I'm good. You got to come up with at least one shout out. Think of what, I mean, you're married. Can you not think of at least one person to give a shout out to? Okay. Shout out to Ellie. Shout out to Colin Firth. Shout out to Kira Knightley. Yes. Yes. Shout out to Hugh Grant. We're just going to end the show shout out to Hugh Grant. With, with the entire cast of love. Actually shout out to uh crap. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Bean. Shout out to Mr. Mr. Bean. Bean. <laughs> the show's gone off the rails. Wrap yeah, it up. It's, it's gotten better. This you is just like shout peak, it out this to is Mr. Peak, Bean. This is peak MPN. What are you talking about? Shout out to Liam Neeson. Yes. How could I forget Liam Neeson? <laughs> shout out to the dude that was in Game of Thrones, the little cute boy, Liam Neeson's son. Then it became a real weirdo on Game of Thrones. Shout out to shout him. Shout out to Chiwetel Ejiofor, the best actor that no one knows his name. Yes, yes, he's awesome. He won an Oscar. Shout out to uh to Rick Grimes. Uh, Rick Grimes, what's the, Andrew uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Andrew Lincoln. Emma Thompson. Trying, okay, yeah, Emma Thompson. Shout out to Emma Thompson. Don't worry, I faded this out several minutes ago. <laughs> 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 no, all that's getting included in the show. I'm making an executive decision. You're keeping all that in. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for listening to Mr. Presti's Neighborhood. It's an excellent show. Make sure to uh, read all of Matt Craig's articles on Daily Thunder and do not scorch him in the Daily Thunder comment section, please. <laughs> He's had enough of that. Um, I'm talking to you, Matt's mom. Thank you so much for listening to Mr. Presti's Neighborhood. Uh, I'm out, man. That nigga's tripping.